My name is Oliver Herbert, and I'm presenting to you today the work on atmospheres of rocky excrement that I've been doing during my PhD in St Andrews. So, the main one of the main questions of astrobiology is whether a planet as itself is dry, has no liquid water at the surface, or whether it does have actual water at the surface so that life as we know it can thrive. So the big question is, how can we actually detect this from our own Earth? How can we tell that on other planets? And therefore, one has to understand that during, for example, transmission spectroscopy, one is actually probing the high parts of the atmosphere, that when the light is traveling through the atmosphere, we actually do see only the composition of the high parts of the atmosphere. And if we are fortunate at some point in the future, with future instrumentations, we get some scattering effects from some particular um, cloud condensates. And those we can then um, ana analyze and tell which the actual condensates that is. But that is not really exactly the crust composition. The crust composition can be slightly different. And that is what I am working on and what I'm gonna present today. And in order to do so, we need to understand that the crust and the atmosphere, there are many links for, for them. And especially at the very bottom where the crust is outgassing into the atmosphere, there can be volcanism, there can be plate tectonics, which actually drive some parts of the, uh, from the exposed rock towards the mantle again. Chemical weathering can, affect, can have some effects from the atmosphere onto the uh, rock composition. Then higher up in the atmosphere, where we do have potential cloud formation, the clouds are depleting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the elements that are used up in the clouds so that the element composition below and above the clouds are different. Atmospheric loss, parts of atmos the atmosphere can be lost through space. And then last but definitely not least, photochemistry. Stellar radiation, cosmic rays can change the um, atmospheric composition, the chemical buildup of the atmosphere. However, at the beginning of this talk, I would only focus on the atmosphere crust interaction at the very bottom of this atmosphere, and then provide insights to the surface conditions and then set the preconditions for cloud formation later in the talk. The model I'm using is an equilibrium chemistry model with an equilibrium condensation called GGChem by Peter Wojtke, my supervisor. And it basically takes a given set of elements, the total uh, element abundances, so given amount of hydrogen, given amount of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, but also with elements like calcium, titanium, or so, and puts them into one big cauldron under a given pressure, a given temperature, and then on the basis of minimization of Gibbs free energy, calculates what's most stable in the gas phase. There are no, over, uh, no supersaturated molecules in the gas phase, and we allow that, or we force that by actually having condensation. And these condensates are then building up the crust of the, of the planet that we have. So one of the big uh, components to, uh, to vary here is the total element abundance. And that's what I show you here in this plot on the right-hand side, where we have on the, on the y-axis, the element abundance relative to silica and on the x-axis, um, different uh, elements. And we see when we compare the squares and the diamonds, the CI chondrite left over rock from the formation of the solar system, which is particularly rich in the volatiles, the gas loving um, elements like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, but also sulfur or phosphorus, uh, in comparison to the bulk silicate, earth, which is earth without its core and counting all of the elements. And interestingly, elements like aluminium or calcium are very, very similar for those, but they have different effects on the resulting atmosphere. And that's what I show you here in this plot, where I'll walk you through it now. So it's 100 bar atmosphere and temperature range from 100 to 5,000 Kelvin. And on the y-axis, we have the abund molecular abundance of the gas species. For the very high temperatures, we vaporize the rock. We have metal oxides dominating the atmosphere. And then for lower temperatures, water, sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide are the most important parts of the atmosphere. And they then condense out at different points, leaving nitrogen behind. For the CI chondrite, this image is relatively the same. Metal oxides at the high temperature range and then water, carbon dioxide and nitrogen leaving behind. But there's also methane, H2CO and atomic hydrogen. And that is called because there's just so much more volatiles in this model. If we now want to investigate where the um, hydrogen itself goes, where does the hydrogen go? And that's what I show you here in the range of 1,200 Kelvin, 
where the uh, water gas is getting lower and lower in abundance, and all of the hydrogen is forming sodophlogopite or phlogopite. Those are two phyllosilicates, so, uh, so hydrated rocks that actually incorporate OH into their lattice structure. And if we look at the CI chondrite model, we see that there's a huge variety of different phyllosilicates that incorporate a lot of the hydrogen, but there's still enough hydrogen left that we can actually form liquid water over these um, phyllosilicates that need to be saturated. We can also force our bulk silicate earth model in order uh, to actually form water. And by that we can do by increasing hydrogen and oxygen abundances. And then we can saturate the um, phyllosilicates. And then on top of that, we will have the liquid water because the phyllosilicates are just more, much more stable. So this was only the atmosphere crust interaction layer. An atmosphere is more than that. And it's also more than just the troposphere, but for this part, I'm talking about the troposphere, so the lower part of the atmosphere, where the pressure, or where the temperature is just decreasing with the pressure, as shown on the plots here at the bottom left here. And as we build our hydrostatic polytropic atmosphere from bottom to top, we solve chemical phase equilibrium in every atmospheric layer. And every time when there's a condensate stable, we take the condensates, take them out, interpret them as a thermally stable cloud and only take the gas phase as the total element abundance of the layer above. And with that, we actually do build our atmosphere that is actually depleted in those condensates that are taken out that formed clouds. There's no kinetic cloud formation in here. That's the next step to do, but this is to investigate what is thermally stable. The fact of this for the element, uh, for the molecular abundances, in the atmosphere can be seen in this plot. On the right-hand side being the actual molecular abundance at the bottom of the uh, atmosphere, and then going to the left is to the top of the atmosphere. We see a methane-dominated atmosphere at the beginning, and especially we see that water, the blue line, and carbon dioxide are decreasing significantly throughout the atmosphere. And that is caused by the condensation of, um, of clouds. And what we see here is what actual cloud condensates are there, water, the blue lines, stable throughout the atmosphere, and then also graphite, the bottom of the atmosphere, and then ammonium chloride and ammonium hydrosulfate. If we want to investigate further uh, temperatures at the same time of varying the surface temperatures, that's uh, going to be in the next plot, but it's going to be a bit confusing, so I'll just explain the axis here. So surface temperature, 3, 000, uh, 300 to 1,000 Kelvin, and then the, uh, each atmosphere is one column. So a model with uh, 400 Kelvin starts here, goes up, goes up, and it's just one column here. If we plot now all of the condensates in here that are thermally stable and relatively abundant, we, we get this result. And that is actually really interesting because we already see here that we have a discrepancy between high temperature condensates and low temperature condensates. High temperature condensates, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and iron sulfur. Whereas the low temperature condensates are water, there's carbon, the black lines, and then as I mentioned earlier, ammonium chloride, potassium chloride, but also sulfur S2, the orange one here, forming some of the condensates. If we compare this to the, the bulk silicate earth model, we see that the overall image is roughly the same. We have the high temperature condensates and the low temperature condensates, but there is graphite now breaching this gap of high and low temperature condensates. And actually in our models, we see that graphite is the only condensate that can do so. So graphite is quite special and that needs to be investigated in the future of how we can form these graphite clouds, some other points. But also really interesting for the bulk silicate earth, which does not have liquid water at the surface, as just as a reminder, we see that we do have water clouds, water ice clouds high up in the atmosphere. And also when we just increase the, uh, the water abundance in that atmosphere a bit, in the total element abundance, but not allowing liquid water condensation yet, we can drag down the water cloud base so that we can actually have water clouds at like roughly 100, 200 bar, uh, 200 millibars, whereas the surface is still quite, still pretty dry. And we actually only have water clouds touching the ground, touching the surface when there is liquid water stable at the surface. And that can also be seen in this plot when we don't have a constant surface pressure but we vary the surface pressure and surface temperature in a way that we do have the exact same atmospheric structure for the high atmosphere. So the higher parts of the atmosphere are the same in the pressure temperature profile 
for all of these models, but they have, just have different atmospheric depth. And what we see here, where I just shown you the um, show you the what liquid water and uh, water ice clouds, we see that basically through, independent of the um, of the actual surface pressure and surface temperature, we have the ability to have liquid water clouds. That is really interesting if one wants to think about some aerial biosphere, some biology somewhere in clouds on a, on a planet. So that is already really interesting. But the, the second interesting part is when we take a look at all the other condensates that we have in, the, in these models, where we see, especially I just want to mention the H2S cloud up here at the very high part of the atmosphere. And that is only appearing for the high surface uh, pressures where we have a high surface temperature, also quite a lot of sulfur in the atmosphere and a lot of hydrogen in the atmosphere. And then we can actually form the H2S clouds. And that can be used according to these models um, as an in potential indicator for high surface pressures. And with that, I'd like to leave you with my conclusions that only the oversaturation of phyllosilicates can result in stable water condensing and chemical equilibrium at the surface. But independent of whether or not there's liquid water at the surface, we can have water clouds in the atmosphere. And overall, we want to use this model to get an insight of what kind of crust induces what kind of clouds. And then to basically trace back, we see cloud A and then say that could be these kind of cloud, uh, these kind of cross types. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.